Uh, we're going to look at insecticide resistance for alfalfa weevils in Wyoming and Montana. And so uh, this is a study that uh, Scott Shell, our entomologist down at UW campus, and myself are partnering with Montana State with Dr. Warner and Erica Rodbell to, to look at this study. So we helped them get some samples uh, this uh, last year, I should say. And so this is a kind of an update of what they have found and what they are seeing. So thank you so much for joining us and, and look forward to your presentation. Uh, thanks, Jeremiah. So I'll just give a quick one minute uh, introduction before Erica gets started. So I'm an associate professor of entomology at Montana State University. And about four or five years ago, I, I switched my research from small grains or some of my research from small grains to alfalfa because producers were um, giving reports of more damage to alfalfa from the alfalfa weevil. And as I got onto the phone with colleagues from other states, this seemed to be not restricted to Montana. Um, and then what, what, the other thing that was clear is producers were starting to report that they were applying insecticide two or even three times in the same season, and they weren't getting alfalfa weevil control. In fact, the numbers were increasing. And this kind of uh, goes towards a question I heard earlier, great questions from the audience, by the way where once you have weevil, you tend to have it for a long time. Well, we do see that in um, insecticide resistant fields because those adult populations are increasing and they're overwintering nearby. Uh, so along with Ian Grettenberger at uh, UC Davis, we applied for some USDA funding and uh, we have a project to quantify um, and we're talking about pyrethroid insecticides, Warrior, Mustang Max, those types of products. Um, we, uh, we have a project to, uh, to quantify uh, resistance across the Western US as much as we can and use that information to come up with uh, a resistance management plan to mitigate the economic impacts of resistance. Um, as Jeremiah mentioned, Erica Rodbell is a PhD student in my lab who's uh, working on this project, and I'll uh, turn it over to Erica to, to give an update on her research. Thank you for the introduction, Kevin. I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Okay. All right. Well, this is going to be a quick presentation um, on alfalfa weevil resistance, generally to uh in Montana and Wyoming. Erica, so, you can put it on slideshow view. We'll sorry. be able to see okay, your slide sorry. a little better. Um, so I'm from Schenectady, New York, originally, as well as Lima, Peru. Um, I went and did my undergraduate degree at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, where I majored in conservation biology. I got my master's degree at Iowa State University in entomology and sustainable agriculture, and broad scale research interests general, generally pertain to agroecology farm management, sustainable agriculture, and entomology. Okay, so a quick outline for the talk for today. I'm gonna to give you a broad scale overview of alfalfa, of alfalfa production in America, um, alfalfa weevil and the damage that they cause alfalfa production. And then I'll go through the methodology from last year's uh, field research projects, um, and then the results from Montana, Wyoming, and a brief synopsis from the Western region as a whole. So alfalfa is an economically important crop. It originated from Mesopotamia and it is considered to be the third most valuable field crop exported from the United States following corn and soybean. It is valued to be around $10.8 billion a year and that is due in part to its high protein content, which is really important for dairy and beef production systems. America ranks number one globally in regard to the quantity and value of alfalfa being produced followed by Australia and Spain. Alfalfa weevil, however, is considered to be one of the most economically damaging insect pests of alfalfa in North America. And this is due in part to feeding damage. Adults are not considered to cause uh, a primary source of economic injury, but larvae are, and that is due to yield loss, which ranges between 10 to 15% annually. Larvae feed pr primarily on leaves, which reduces the leaf to stem ratio, and that is called skeletonization. When skeletonization is severe enough, you'll, you can see it from the sides of fields, from the road, and that's what's pictured here on the bottom of the screen. 
what this does is that it reduces the overall forage protein content, so it reduces the quality of the alfalfa. Alfalfa weevils are not native to North America. They are native to Eurasia and North Africa. And there were three separate introductions that we know of today, with each introduction being regarded as its own strain. The first strain, the first introduction to be recorded was uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1904. And that was called the Western strain. The Egyptian strain start, uh, was first reported in 1939 in Yuma, Arizona followed by the Eastern strain in Maryland in 1952. Regardless of strain, the primary host of alfalfa, or the, sorry, the primary host of alfalfa weevil is alfalfa, and each of these strains do cause economic damage. Just a brief overview of alfalfa weevil life cycle, and I'll just like to highlight this real quick. It depends on where you are in North America. Since we are, in, since I am in Montana and you all are more likely than not in Wyoming, I'll just focus it on the upper region of North America. So egg laying generally occurs from May to June, typically when the temperature reaches around 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Approximately two weeks later, you'll start to see larvae emerge and they'll go through their, their four larval instars within a 21 day period. After which they'll pupate for about 10 to 12 days, and they'll emerge at, then as adults. And then they'll move on to their overwintering habitat in the fall, and this process starts all over again. Since larvae are considered to be the most economically damaging life stage of alfalfa weevil, I'll be focusing exclusively on alfalfa weevil larvae for the remainder of the talk. There are three groupings of management, how to control alfalfa weevil larvae populations, and generally they pertain to biological and control, cultural control like early harvest, and chemical control. And it is chemical control that I'll be focusing on today. Based on producer reports that Kevin mentioned, we hypothesized that if populations resistant, resistant, resistant to learn to say halothrin were present, they would be in or around Southern Bighorn County, Montana. As such, we focused a lot of our energy on Southern Bighorn County, Montana, as well as surrounding counties within the Southern tier, which I'll show a map later. What does this mean? Well, we had weekly collections from field sites within the county. And because of these weekly collections, we had enough individuals to run full uh, bioassays with lambda cyhalothrin, zeta cypermethrin, and permethrin. Because bioassays are not indicative of field trials, it's really difficult to compare the two to each other. We also followed it up with an ATV trial. And spoiler alert, it is Bighorn County that showed the highest degree of resistance. So what is resistance? Well, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee in 2020 released a definition saying that resistance is a heritable trait or sorry, heritable change in the sensitivity of a pest population that is reflected in the repeated failure of a product to achieve the expected level of control when used according to the label recommendation for that pest species. I would just like to note that this is, we only have one year's worth of data from Montana and Wyoming so far. So please bear that in mind. We have yet to retry these bioassays. Okay, so the doses that we included for lambda cyhalothrin ranged from 0 0.033 to 33 times the label rate. This is just to contextualize what our concentrations mean. Doses four and five highlighted in green indicate the minimum and the maximum doses. And the same is true for permethrin. Again, doses four and five being the minimum and the maximum label rate. To run our bioassays, we applied one milliliter of a dose in a sterile vial. And the glass vials were allowed to dry completely on hot dog rollers. And that just allowed for the even distribution of the active ingredient along the interior surface of the vial. The vials were then labeled with their dose, active ingredient, and date. And they were stored in a dark cabinet until use. After a two week period or after use, vials were then sterilized. To collect alfalfa weevils, we used a sweet sweet my collection method and place the samples in a paper bag or paper container and brought them back to the lab for bioassay work. The bioassays were set up by placing 10 third and fourth instar larvae into a treated glass vial with five vials per dose. 
Bottles were then placed under tinfoil and maintained at 21 degrees Celsius, so that's around 70, deg 70 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours. After which time we were able to expose the treated larvae to a glass petri dish heated to approximately 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that just encouraged crawling behavioral behavior and that helped us quantify whether or not the, well, the number of individuals that were dead or alive. This data, oh, well, I should define what dead <laughs> was for us. Um, dead individuals were those that could not crawl more than one body length. Live individuals were those that of course could. And this data allowed us to define and determine what the lethal dose that causes 50% mortality was. So we entered our data into Polo, which is a statistical software that is designed specifically for this purpose. It's designed to help researchers quantify what lethal doses are. So for data quality control, this was really important to us. And um, there were two main parameters for, that we used. The first being that if the control mortality was greater than 20%, we omitted that data set. That just meant that there was something else within our bioassay or within the population that was um, impacting the survivorship of those that were included in the bioassay. So we just couldn't trust that data. In addition, we also omitted data sets with a T ratio of the slope that was less than 1.96. Um, and I'll just keep going from there. Okay. So, Defining resistance in the context of this project, and I would just like to say, since we only have one year's worth of data, more data will help us flush this out and determine the categories a little bit more. But broadly speaking, for, for this presentation, I'll just walk you through the categories that we have right now. The first is a susceptible um, category, which is a lethal dose that, confer that causes 50% mortality that is less than the minimum application rate. Moderate resistance is between the minimum application rate and 10 times the minimum application rate and highly resistant populations would be those that had an, a lethal dose that causes 50% mortality greater than 10 times the minimum application rate. I would just like to highlight that the minimum and the maximum application rates are designed to cause 90% mortality for a susceptible population. And we're gonna be working around the lethal dose that causes 50% 50, 50 mortality. So bear that in mind. So an example of a resistant versus a susceptible population uh, we have two populations, one from Bighorn County, Montana, the other from Madison County, Montana. The graph in the middle shows these two populations plotted out with the y-axis being the percent response. So that is the percentage of the individuals within, within that bioassay that died at a certain dose. The x-axis is the concentration in micrograms per centimeter squared. So Madison County, Montana is the susceptible population that we we were plotting out here. And that is highlighted in that dark purple line in that graph. Bighorn County, Montana had a population that was highly resistant and that is plotted out in that pink line in that graph. What is interesting and what's pretty shocking is that even at the highest dose, this population from Bighorn County never exceeded 30% mortality. The table on the right hand of the screen shows that the highest dose included in this bioassay is around 33 times the minimum application rate. So you cannot apply, uh, legally you cannot apply that high of a concentration within your own field. So bear that in mind. So this, um, this table here at the bottom of the screen kind of highlights what I'll be showing you in, uh, in the upcoming slides. And that is the lethal dose um, and the concentration that will cause 50% mortality. So uh, just for context, we have Bighorn County coming in at around 117.85 micrograms per centimeter squared. That far exceeds the minimum, or far exceeds the minimum and maximum application rates. And we don't even have a concentration within the, these bioassays that is that concentrated. Madison County, Montana, so the susceptible population had an LD50 value that was less than the minimum application rate. And th thus we determined it to be susceptible based on our parameters. Other counties that we are looking at, including Bighorn in Montana, uh, ranged predominant, were predominantly focused on the southern tier, but we did manage to get a little bit uh, north, samples from a little bit farther north, like in Lake County, Richland County, and Prairie County, Montana. In Wyoming, we sampled from, with the help of Jeremiah, of course, from two counties in the northern portion of Wyoming. So that would be Park County and Sheridan County. 
So some data from Bighorn County, Montana, we had two populations evaluated against Lambda Cyhalothrin, both of which had lethal LD50 values that were between 143.8 to 1,178.5 times the minimum application rate. So they were determined to be highly resistant. Zeta uh came out to be around about the same, 44.7 to 918.2 times the minimum application rate. So the same populations were determined to be highly resistant to zeta cypromethrin as well. When, it, when uh, conducting the bioassays for permethrin, we found the population to be moderately resistant, and that is due to the, due to the fact that the LD50 value was around 1.54 to 7.18 times the minimum application rate. To corroborate our findings within a bioassay, we conducted an ATV field trial, and what we found was pretty surprising. So this graph kind of highlights um, the data about 13 days after exposure. And it is the mean number of larvae per 10 sweeps plus or minus standard deviation on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the treatment. So we have the control on the left, we have lambda cyhalothrin in the middle followed by permethrin and endoxicarp on the right. And what we found was that the plots that were treated with lambda cyhalothrin did not significantly differ from that of the control. Permethrin, though significantly different from lambda cyhalothrin, was not significantly different from the control either, but endoxicarp, the active ingredient of steward, was significantly different from the control. In fact, it was the only insecticide that was when running these um, ATV trials. So this is a very long table and I'll walk you through it, so please don't worry. But for the other counties included in our field study from 2020, we found that in Broadwater County, three of the four uh, field sites were moderately resistant to lambda cyhalothrin, with one being susceptible. And the LD50 values range, uh, range from 2.6 to 3.4 times the minimum application rate. Beaverhead County had one field site that was evaluated and it was determined to be susceptible. Gallatin County had two field sites that were evaluated and they were determined to be moderately resistant with LD50 values ranging from 1.6 to 3.7 times the minimum application rate. One field site from Lake County, Montana had an LD50 value that was two times the minimum application rate and was determined to be moderately resistant. Ma uh, Madison County had one susceptible and one moderately resistant population. Powder River County uh, had three populations that were evaluated. One was determined to be susceptible and two were considered to be moderately resistant River Valley County had two populations evaluated and both were considered to be moderately resistant with LD50 values ranging from 1.3 times to 4.2 times the minimum application rate. Richland County followed up with one field site that was considered to be moderately resistant with the LD50 value being the minimum application rate. Uh, due to the high number of individuals that is needed to run and conduct these full bioassays, we were not able to run full dose series on all of the populations evaluated against lambda cyhalothrin. So that is why the table is much shorter. Um, but for those that were evaluated, we found that two from Broadwater County, one, um, one being highly resistant and the other moderately resistant, ranging from 38.28 to four times the minimum application rate. Beaverhead County had one population evaluated against permethrin and that population was determined to be moderately resistant with the LD50 value being four times the minimum application rate. Gallatin County had one population that was evaluated with permethrin and that came in at around 19 times the minimum application rate and that was determined to be highly resistant. Madison County had one population evaluated against permethrin and the LD50 value indicated that that population was susceptible. Potter River County had three field sites evaluated against permethrin two of which were moderately resistant and one was susceptible. And Richland County had one field site that had an LD50 value that was around five times the minimum application rate and that was determined to be moderately resistant. Okay, so moving on to Wyoming, Lambda Cyhalothrin bioassays. We had one field site from Park County and one field site from Sheridan County that were evaluated. One, the, the one field site from Park County came in at around eight times the minimum application rate and that was determined to be moderately resistant. Sheridan County had an LD50 value that was 22.3 times the minimum application rate, and that was determined to be highly resistant. 
So I mentioned that um, quality control was really important for us when it came to data and data analysis. Uh, the field site two here in Sheridan County, the Lambda Cyhalothrin bioassay that we ran did not meet that quality control requirement. So we don't have that Lambda Cyhalothrin data, but we do have the permethrin data for it. And what we found was that for both of the field sites from Sheridan County, um, they were both moderately resistant to permethrin. Just broad, uh, broadly speaking, this is a regional project. Um, so we have a lot of preliminary data from 2020 from the Western region and one field site from the Midwest. And it shows that uh, pyrethroid resistance is widespread. It suggests this. Um, however, more bioassays from 2021 will help map this resistant, resistant populations across the region. And just for um, context, each of these red asterisks represent a resistant population that we have run bioassays on so far. Um, so this is pretty daunting. Okay, yes, yeah, so it is a daunting problem, but what do we recommend? What do we recommend to producers? How do we avoid this problem? If you have a moderately resistant population or a susceptible population, how do you retain that susceptibility within that population? Well, we recommend that uh, producers and chemical applicators should hope to reduce the pressure to select resistant individuals. And what does that mean? Well, that means to favor susceptible individuals, keep them on the landscape, keep them breeding, and help maintain those uh, susceptible genes within that population longer, as long as you can. Um, and one can do, do this by avoiding uh, repeated applications of the same mode of action. So don't apply and reapply pyrethroids, which is of the mode of action group 3A. And I mentioned adoxacarp being a good active ingredient, really effective at controlling alpha levels, at least based on our ATV trial. Um, and that is the active ingredient of Stuart. So please don't repeat, don't repetitively apply Stuart on your fields, which is the mode of action group 22A. So rotate insecticides, uh, specifically mode of action groups. So Stuart one year, pyrethroy the next, and use a cultural control. Um, method as well, which could be harvesting early. So a key point on integrated pest management is to apply an insecticide only when necessary. So maintain a healthy stand, monitor your weevil populations um, at relative to economic threshold, and take no action if economic threshold has yet to be met. And then harvest early to salvage yield. You'll be saving money in regard to saving by not having to pay for a chemical application and you'll be saving on yield because you'll be harvesting at that point in time. And that really works if, if, you, if the timing works out well for you. Okay, so in addition to that, we also recommend that uh, one treats a field differently. So don't use the same method of control for each field, change it up a bit. So let's say that three out of your four fields have reached threshold, what do you do? Well, let's say field site one, which is in the middle of this aerial photograph here, um, is at threshold, you may apply a pyrethroid, if that works. Field site two is at threshold, you apply steward, so endoxicarp. Field site three, harvest early if you can. And if in field site four, it's below economic threshold, so you do no treatment. And what does this mean? Well, it means that you are varying your control methods such that you retain the susceptible individuals, right? You're not, sele you're not selecting for resistance across your area. You're allowing for susceptible individuals to remain and overwinter and then breed in the spring. And this is going to be my shameless plug for our research project. Um, I'm funded by a, a research, a research um, project focusing on resistant alfalfa weevil funded by the USDA in conjunction with UC Davis and Ian Grettenberger's lab. So I'm going to be shamelessly asking you to please ship me samples. Um, if you wanna know if, you're, if your alfalfa weevils are resistant to lambda cyhalothrin, permethrin or zeta cypermethrin, we would be more than happy to run those bioassays for you. Please contact Kevin or I directly. Um, we would really appreciate those samples. And hey, Erica, that, yes. thank you so much. That was fantastic. Okay, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll just go to the questions. I'll take questions now. 
sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Erica. No, it's okay. Okay. Um, well, and the first thing, if you would, Erica, um, if people are going to look at sending you samples, can you talk about how many you need in that? And and so that was one of my challenges of getting you samples was was meeting the minimum uh, threshold, if you will, to even run the bioassays for you. Yeah. So if you could just speak to that a little bit so people understand that it's not five weevils that you need. Oh, we need thousands. Um, <laughs> thousands. Um, for one full bioassay, um, so I think for that we need around 450, 500 ideally. And you always want to round up on that because in transit they can die as well. So um, we want to pick those that look as healthy as possible to run our bioassays on. Um, seeing as we want to run bioassays on zeta cypromethrin and promethrin, just multiply that by three. And that's, that's how much we need. Um, sometimes, and due to data quality control, sometimes we have to rerun bioassays. So keep that, keep that in mind. I know, Jeremiah, you got caught with that one <laughs> last year. Um, yeah. yeah, no, that, fantastic. Can you stop sharing your screen for a bit while we handle questions? And mm -hmm. yeah, so you're looking for 1,000 to 2,000 uh, living larva once they hit your desk. So it's a, a vast population that you need sent in as a sample and thus getting them mailed to you or delivered to you can be a bit of a challenge because it is time sensitive that way. So uh, Kevin, do you have any comments about that? Um, well, what we can do is um, we can resend you some directions too. And anyone from Wyoming could, if you're, if that's fine, could work through you. Um, usually we find ship, uh, uh, paper bag, uh, in a paper bag with some alfalfa and then into a styrofoam cooler with an ice pack seems to keep them in the best shape. You know, if it's a warm day, they're not going to last too long in the heat. Mm -hmm. Great. We also, sorry. Um, we also, uh, we think that over like 24 hour shipment. So overnight shipment is the best way to go because time is of the essence. As soon as they get pulled from the field, it's. We need to we need to baby them as quickly as possible, <laughs> which can be difficult for some locations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and in my experience, you have to hit the the UPS or FedEx or overnight distribution at the right time because if you hit it wrong and it sits for an extra day, you've jeopardized it. So, mm -hmm. great. Let's get into some questions. So, Bob has a question: Does egg laying occur at forty five degree soil temperature? So. And much of it depends on the, well, the eggs are ov oviposited on the, in the stems. So it's mostly just t air temperature in regard to promoting crawling behavior and, and mating behavior. And that's what we're really looking for, right? That's what the 45 degree temperature mark is really important in regard to gauging when egg laying will be occurring. And I, I think um, 45 is probably the lower end of that adult activity. So that's when the adults will start to become active, move into the field, mate, and then as it warms up. And what we'll see in the spring season too, we could have a week of warm weather and they'll, they'll, they'll become active and start mating and laying eggs. If it gets cool again, then they become less active. Great, our next question is from David. What is making these bugs resistant, not using recommended dosages? Um, so it's just the repeat application, the repetitive application of the same mode of action group. And that's just selecting for resistant individuals, right? So if you go out and you spray your field with the same mode of action over and over and over again, the resistant individuals will survive more readily than susceptible individuals will. And that just means that resistant individuals will be allowed to mate and reproduce. So the following year, you may have more individuals within your field that are resistant, right? And then if you, apply again with the same mode of action, you'll be selecting for those individuals to mate and reproduce for the following year. So it's, it's not that people are not following label rate recommendations or misreading labels. It's just applying and reapplying the same mode of action over and over again. And if I understand that, Erica, it's uh, what you're saying, and it's not because I sprayed it this year, right? It's multiple years is what's gonna build that up. Do you have an idea 
approximate how many years that would take? It depends. Um, I don't know. I think based off of conversations with other um, researchers that have dealt with resistance, it takes about five generations to build a population up to be resistant enough to, to notice it. Um, at least to the, not, I, this is early days, right? We're only beginning to delve into this problem and, and beginning to explore it. But it takes about five generations generally. This is just broad statement on not necessarily specific to alfalfa weevil, just for resistance and other species as well. Um, and since there is generally one generation per year of alfalfa weevil, it would take, I'll just brought, like, it probably would take about five years, but that's very generalistic. Great. Another question from Scott. Could adding a synergist such as PBO in a pyrethroid application in moderately resistant populations, would that help? I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, I, not I necessarily can jump on that one. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's unclear right now what the mechanism of resistance is. Obviously, the ones that from Bighorn County that look highly resistant, that sure looks like active site resistance at the sodium ion channel level, where, where a synergist wouldn't help. help. Now, moderate uh, resistance, maybe that's um, the de detoxification enzymes where that synergist would help. But the problem is, you know, we have to figure out if that's really the case or not, because where you see moderate resistance, is it simply, is it, is it a different mechanism or is it simply active site resistance, but it's only 20 or 30% of the population has that resistance gene. So, you know, I guess we don't have enough information. I mean, that would be easy enough to test in the field. Great. Uh, our next question comes in from Lonnie. So your recommendation is to rotate modes of action on an annual basis. How about in a situation or if in a second application is needed in that same year, rotate to the second mode of action in that same year? Well, it depends on how effective the first application was, right? So um, if you are dealing with a population where you have, like, let's say you spray, you spray early, you have eggs that have yet to larvae that have yet to emerge from you know their eggs within the within the stem of the alfalfa, and you spray right. They're not going to get exposed to that mode of action, not for a while, not until they emerge and they interact with that that foliage. So you, it depends on when when to apply, and it also depends on when the second application would be needed, right? Because one of the another point that I would just like to get across is that if your first application was ineffective, you did not see the knockdown that you really wanted to see. That's an indication that you're dealing with a relatively resistant population, and I would recommend moving on to a different mode of action if need be. Um, yeah, that would be that would be it. So definitely move to that mode of action if you're seeing a resistance in that in that mm -hmm. situation. Right. right. And if you if you wait maybe two or three weeks and you start to see early in star larvae, that just means that those larvae have yet to be exposed to that mode of action. Um, and so that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're dealing with um, a population that is resistant. It just means that those individuals had yet to be exposed to the toxin. Great. Yeah. When we saw that in a field here in Park County, the field I was sampling, uh, I sampled it. They sprayed it. They had good knockdown. They felt they had good control and they ended up harvesting. And then in the second uh, growth of that crop for the second harvest, they actually had another flush of weevil population. And uh, your results did come back and say they did have a level of resistance. I think that was moderate if I remember correctly, but uh, it wasn't an insecticide failure necessarily. That was that situation. They had more eggs developing and, and hatching as best we can assume. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's complex. Uh, a question from Dr. Jabor. Do we know anything about how quickly someone could dilute resistance? For example, if you switch to only spraying once every few years, could you build susceptibility back into a population or are you stuck with the resistance for long term? 
that's a really good question. And we don't know, we don't have the, the data for that, but just from working with organic systems in Southern uh, California and in Arizona, we just got back from Arizona actually a couple days ago. Um, but what the, the interesting thing is that even though you may be an organic producer, if you have conventional fields surrounding you, they'll, the alfalfa weevils within those systems will still move on to the, that edge habitat to overwinter. And that allows for the mixing of the population, right? And then they'll disperse from there. So we, the population from California that I'm thinking of is an organic field. It's been an organic field for year, years and they still, they have resistance. Um, they have a moderate degree of resistance. And I think it's largely due to the fact that they are in a valley that has a lot of conventional um, alfalfa production. Um, uh, we have data out of one field site that we just got um, in, in Arizona from about a week ago. And that indicated that it was this organic, this uh, new organic field, so just started back in October, has a high degree of resistance to not only lambda cyhalothrin, but permethrin and zeta cypermethrin. So we don't know, we can track this if we keep on going back to fields, but I think time will tell, I think. It's and I'll just common. add it, um, every insect species and every active ingredient will be a little different. Um, but it was interesting, Erica, did, was there not a field in Arizona where we saw quite high resistance last year and it wasn't as high this year? So I think we're th you're thinking of one from rural Arizona. Right. Um, we were not able to retest that population because they harvested early. Um, so we were dealing with about an inch or two of stubble so we couldn't sweep net through it. But yeah, that, that population, though I did not present on it today, but yes, that was highly resistant as well. Um, yes. But in Bighorn County, we're gonna have a excellent opportunity because I'm pretty sure the producer there is already switching to steward. Mm -hmm. So over the next few years, we can monitor how quickly that, that resistance, at least, at least it's only one field, but it gives us some sort of observation. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, just a comment from Scott Shell. Thank you. A great presentation and information. Uh, another question from Scott, uh, a different Scott. Have you evaluated the various costs of applying modes of action? So looking at an economic mm -hmm. consideration. I've done some preliminary calculations on this. Um, so endoxicarp is, so steward is a little bit more expensive, not a lot more expensive than lambda cyhalothrin, so warrior two. Um, but when it comes down to it, right, if, if you're applying an insecticide that you think that your population might be resistant to, you'd still be acquiring defoliation, right, um, despite the application. So you might have to worry about repeated applications of, of, of warrior two. And over time, that does add up. But I think based on my calculations, endoxicarp, one application of endoxicarp at the maximum amount costs the same or similar amount to repeat, uh, two or three applications of warrior two. So it's all about how effective the application is the first time around. Great, thank you so much. Uh, one question I have, and I've, I've thought about this as we've been working through the study and I'd like to get your perception. I appreciated your, this is our best assumption of what to do, how to, how to combat resistance, right, in our alfalfa weevil, especially if you don't have it yet. Um, so you were talking about it on a farm scale, like if you had four different fields. I've had the, the thought of, is it on, let's say the Bighorn Basin size, right? We're talking four counties. If you could, if we could organize our producers and, and get our uh, commercial applicators to apply the same mode of action this year, and then rotate it next year. Is there a difference on the farm scale versus a, a geographical scale of that rotation of mode of action? Do you anticipate anything that way? So one of the questions that kind of pops up into my head is how far are they flying, right? 
because what you're really curious about is where do they go for overwintering? How far, what, which fields are you dealing with? And where are they converging? And where do they go from there in the, in the, in the spring to lay their eggs? And so if you have this large scale selection pressure of the same mode of action, you may be, that, that one, the, one, the, the flight and overwintering habitat is one question that I have. The other question is, is if you do apply that a singular mode of action on the landscape scale, you would have a huge selection pressure on susceptible individuals, right? And it's those genes that you want to maintain on the landscape for as long as possible. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I th part of me thinks that it would have to be a multi-tiered approach where if you have not only have one field or one area treated with one mode of action, but also have the other fields treated differently. That way, when you do have over, when, when individuals do overwinter, you do have a higher likelihood of having those susceptible individuals around to mate in the spring. Great. It, it's a tough one, right? It's a brain <laughs> teaser and, and it's complex. It and and it probably you get, goes back to what you guys said before is we just don't quite have enough information to tease out where this resistance is. And, and unfortunately, we don't have a, an aha moment to see that resistance kind of falling off. So thank you so much. I appreciate it, guys. We're going to.